Our text this morning is Psalm 19. We'll be focusing on the first six verses this morning. And then, Lord willing, next week we'll take verses 7 through 11. And then the final uh, part of the message will be verses 12, 13, and 14. I want you to think about, about this morning God and man communicating with one another. Because that's what Psalm 19 is all about. And that's a pretty amazing thought, isn't it? The God of the universe would condescend to communicate with you and I. I want you to think about what it means to communicate this morning. In today's society, they... Um, we have a variety of ways to communicate, don't we? Um, and having three girls, I, I know a lot of those ways. Uh, it's social media, and I'm, I'm deeply concerned about our, our generation of kids today, and I mean this with all seriousness, because I fear that they're, um, they're losing the ability to communicate face-to-face. Um, And that it's all done on computer and social media and uh, talking to one another on, on, to friends on texting and all of that. Uh, It's good to communicate face to face. There's nothing wrong with social media and and texting and those things. It's a, it's a nice part of technology, but uh, it's good to be able to talk with one another with our lips and with our mouths and to be able to talk words to one another and to be able to understand each other. Now, I want you to think about a time when someone tried to communicate something to you and when they were done, you had no idea what they said or you had no idea what they were trying to say. You ever been in that situation before? Um, at the rehabilitation center that, that I manage, we have a, a lot of clients that are struggling with autism. And in the back of uh, our building is where we train these clients how to work. And I'll go back every morning. I love them. I love these clients. Um, and I'm, I'm a hands-on manager, so I'm like, how are you doing this morning? And a lot of them will just... And I just, I don't know what they're trying to say. So I'll just stand there and... Uh, I say, how are you doing this morning? Tell me how, you, how you're feeling. How's your day? Are you excited to be here? But a lot of times with individuals like that, it's hard to understand what they're trying to say. And you really have to listen closely. And um, I'll take a minister, for example. If week after week I got up here and tried to communicate a message to you through the sermon that I preach... And you never got what I was saying. You never figured it out. You just, there was a lack of communication, a total loss there. I'd imagine you'd have a pretty difficult time continuing to come to Post Oak. So I trust that's not the, pr- the, 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 the problem this morning. I trust that the message is um, easily understood. Well, I said all that to say this, or perhaps to ask this question. Did you know God communicates? With man. He communicates with us. And thankfully, when God communicates, He doesn't confuse us. That's a blessing. Now, I wouldn't dare stand up here and say there's never been a time when I haven't confused uh, uh, my congregation with a sermon before. You could all vouch and say, oh, we would say yes, there have been plenty of those times. But God doesn't do that because God is not the author of confusion. And thankfully, when God communicates, He doesn't leave us wondering what the Bible is trying to tell us. He doesn't leave us wondering what He is trying to say to us. If we listen, we hear Him. Right? What did Jesus say? Well, He said this. He said, My sheep hear My voice. My sheep hear My voice. The Bible does not say that My sheep may may hear My voice. 
The Bible does not say that my sheep could possibly hear my voice. The Bible says that the sheep of Jesus hear His voice and they are known of Him and they follow Him. If we listen, we will hear what our Savior says to us. And so I want to listen this morning to God as He communicates to us through His Word. But the first point that we're going to make in verses 1 through 6 is this. God communicates through creation. God communicates to us through creation. Now this is what we would call general revelation. In other words, God reveals Himself and speaks to all men through general revelation. It's very general in the sense that all individuals can see the fact that this is a created world. Right? That somebody had to create this world. That it did not and could not possibly have happened by chance. Everyone can see that. Now, not everyone believes that. So what is the problem? Well, Paul, the Apostle, tells us in Romans chapter 1, verses 19-20, through 20, what the problem is. And he says this, "...because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, because God has showed it unto them." Paul is talking about the heathen. Paul is talking about unbelievers. Paul is telling them that what can be known of God has been shown to them. But what happened with what God showed to unbelievers? For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. The Bible teaches that every individual has seen the power and Godhead through creation, through this general revelation. And no one who has ever lived has any excuse to say that they did not hear this general revelation. No excuse. That's what Paul says in Romans 1 and verse number 20. So the question then becomes, what does God say to us? And what does God say to the world through general revelation? And the first answer is this. Creation says God is glorious. And we see this from verse number 1 of our text. The heavens declare the glory of God. Creation says God is glorious. Psalm 19 verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. Now that word glory there in Psalm 19 and verse 1 carries with it a weightiness, a heaviness, a majesticness, if you will. It's talking about the Lord God Almighty. And it's talking about how God's creation declares to every individual that God is glorious, that God is mighty, that God is powerful. That God who created all things and the God who made all things is a God of order and a God of might and a God of power. And only a God as glorious as the Almighty God whom we serve could supremely design such a wonderful creation. Now when the Bible talks about God's glory being seen in the heavens, it is talking about the absolute majestic perfection of Almighty God. We saw that in Romans 1 verse 20, remember? By creation, God's eternal power is seen. God's, by creation, God's Godhead is seen. All of His glorious attributes are on display in creation. And still, still, after looking and seeing all that God has made and all that God has done in this world, still there are some who would say there is no God. Can you understand that? Because I can't. 
after looking at all that God has done, some would still say, there is no God. And those people, the Bible says, are fools. Only the fool could say in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14 and verse 1 says that very thing. The fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. Only a fool would say everything happened by chance. Only a fool who despises God could say that everything happened um, through the process of evolution and a Big Bang Theory and, and primordial slime becoming this and this becoming this and so on and so forth until by chance, here we are. Only a fool could have that much faith to ignore creation as it screams out, God is glorious. God is glorious. God is glorious. So the first thing that creation says is God is glorious. But then notice the second thing creation says is that God is creative. God is creative. We see this as well from verse number 1. The firmament shows His handiwork. And I like that about that verse. That It says that God would create and, and His creation is called His handiwork. If you look at God's handiwork and you look all around you, you cannot deny that God is a creative God, can you? He would make the heavens and the earth so miraculously beautiful. So wonderful, so in order that God would do all these things by the very work of His own hands that He would make you and me by the very work of His hands. And I like that God didn't take any shortcuts when He did this. You see, when God made all things, He didn't take any shortcuts. You and I probably would have shortcut a few things, right? I don't know about you, but I'm, um, I'm not very handy. I know we have a lot of handy men in here and handy women in here. Um, I thank God for you. There has to be handy men and handy women in this world. I, I just tend to not be one of those individuals. So when it comes to what little bit of construction and things I've done around the house, it usually involves some shortcutting. I'll just be honest and transparent with you this morning. About ten years ago, we, um, we bought one of those clubhouses. Now, when I was little, they were metal swings, much like we have out here. That's all we had, right? Uh, you didn't have these big, massive clubhouses. I thought, no problem. I'll get this thing home. Give me a day and it'll be up. I'm pretty sure it took at least six weeks, and I had at least five different people helping me with that thing. And still the monkey bars didn't get finished, okay? After ten years, they're still in one of my um, garages, because I'm just I'm I'm bad at those things. So I took a shortcut. And by the time I got everything else done, and I looked down and saw those monkey bars and all the wood that had to go into those monkey bars, I said, forget it, I'm done. Right? I'm done. I took a shortcut. My poor deprived girls, right? But God, when He shows His creativity by making such a marvelous and awesome universe, didn't take any shortcuts. And the universe declares and glorifies God as its creator. And man who is made in the image of God should glorify God as our Creator. In fact, the Bible says that the creation that God made is waiting one day for its own redemption. The day when sin will no longer wreak havoc on what has so creatively and wonderfully been made. One of these days, God is going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And the Bible teaches us that. The creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption and the glorious liberty of the children of God. And then the Apostle Paul goes on to say that we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. So the fall of man didn't just affect you and me as human beings. The fall of man affected all of God's creation. And today, creation is groaning and travailing. 
Why do you think we have earthquakes? Why do you think we have tsunamis? Why do you think we have tornadoes? Why do you think we have hurricanes? Why do you think we live here in Putnam and surrounding counties, what I like to call Little Chicago? It is the this if it, it Chicago may be the windiest place in the in the in the United States. We're a close second around here, amen? But why do you think all these things are? It's because creation is waiting for this day right here. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Creation is waiting for the day when God redeems it. Not in the same sense that we are redeemed, but made new in the same sense. We are new creatures in Christ, right? When we become born again, we have been made new creatures in Christ. And one day God will make the heavens and the earth new once again. No longer will it be tainted by sin. No longer will it no longer will there be wind and tornadoes and tsunamis and no longer will you have to worry about going out in the backyard and getting bit by a copperhead or a rattlesnake. No longer will you have to worry about going into the ocean and, and being eaten by a great white shark. No longer will we have to worry about these things. You probably don't worry about those things anyway. But if you saw some of the pictures of the great white sharks that are going up and down the Atlantic coast, I'm sure they've always been there, but man, it just seems like lately they've been popping up from everywhere. Enjoy your vacation this summer, okay? Um, If you're going to the beach, that is. Uh, (laughs) All our kids are out here, right? So I'm not scaring anybody. Uh, But creation is waiting. We won't have to worry about those things one day. And that's a wonderful thing. So, creation cries out that God is glorious. And creation cries out that God is creative. But then thirdly, creation cries out that God is orderly. We see this from verse 2. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. Did you know there is an order to creation? Well, sure you know that. There's a day, right? There's a night. There's light, there's darkness, there's sun, there's moon, there are stars. There is an order to creation. There are seasons, right? All of these things declare that God is a God of order. You know, I won't go into all the details because you've heard them all before, but if we were just as a as the earth, if it was just a little bit closer to the sun, the sun would burn us up. If we were just a little further from the sun, we would all freeze. Now, that just happened by chance. I'm sure of it. Aren't you? What is it? 93 million miles? I don't know if it would be 93.1 million miles that that it would be the problem or or 92.9 million miles. I'm not sure about all that. But the point of the matter is this, that God is a God of order. And every day that we wake up, We are called to recognize that there is a God of order who makes all things, who keeps all things by His sovereign control. And to deny this would be insanity. It would be the work of a fool's heart. God is a God of order. He's not the author of confusion. But He's the author of peace. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, And then, of course, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. God does all things decently and in order, and therefore He calls us to do all things decently and in order. Every day, creation's crying out, God is orderly. God is glorious. God is creative. God is orderly. And then finally, every day, creation is crying out to us saying God is personal. We see this in verses 3-6 through of our text. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them He hath set a tabernacle for the sun, not the sin, but the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from it. 
God does not hide Himself from this group of people over here. No, dear friends, in general revelation, God reveals Himself to everyone. His power, His eternal Godhead can be known by all people. And you don't have to speak a certain language to hear what creation says about God. There's no one language that God reveals Himself to all languages, to all groups of people, everywhere. Everyone that has ever lived has seen the power and Godhead of of the Lord God Almighty. John Calvin says this, and I think I put this in your worksheet, different nations may differ, differ from each other as to language, but the heavens have a common language to teach all men without distinction. And then he goes on to say, as the Apostle Paul says, there is no excuse to not hear what creation is saying about God. There's no excuse. No one will be able to stand before God one day and say, well, I didn't know that there was a God. God will get out His holy, righteous Word. Well, He'll speak them with His mouth because that's what He did, what we hold in our hands. He will speak them with His mouth and He will say, you knew and you're without excuse. What you did is you suppressed it. You suppressed the truth and unrighteousness. You pushed it away. You said, I will have none of God. God is a personal God who reveals Himself to all individuals through general revelation. Now, let me close with some practical applications, okay? Number one, if God expects every human to hear creation, say He is glorious, creative, orderly, and personally, how much more should He expect His peculiar people to worship Him for these things? God has personally made all these things for His creation. And God has personally revealed these truths to us who are Christians by His Holy Spirit. How does that not move us this morning to worship a God so powerful, so creative, so majestic, so glorious, so orderly, so personal? How does it not move us to worship God? The Bible says if we will not worship God, then the rocks will cry out and worship Him. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be one up by a rock. Do you? I don't. I want to worship God. Shame on us if the rocks have to cry out because we keep silent. That's just a practical application. And another one is this. No one can say, as I've been saying, no one can say they have any excuse to not know there is a God because creation speaks this truth to all men. And I won't, you know, I won't stay on this point, practical application, long because I've been making this point through the whole sermon. But through God's general revelation, we all know there is a God. Now, it does not teach the salvation of God, general revelation. It takes special revelation for that, and that's what we're going to look at next week. That's what they call in the radio business a teaser, right? So you'll come back next week to hear about God's special revelation. But though we cannot learn about salvation through general revelation, it does reveal to all individuals the eternal power and Godhead of the Creator, and they will have no excuse when they stand before God one day. The third practical application is this. If all these things are true, and we believe they are because the Bible teaches them, then idolatry is inexcusable because of the display of God's glory in creation. And do you know what idolatry is? It's the outworking of enmity and rebellion against God. Sin, dear friend, brings rebellion against God. Sin brings antagonism against God and His glory and His power and His attributes. Only only sin can make man so foolish that he he would harden his heart against such a God who has created all these things. Only sin could cause mankind to desire to worship the creature more than the Creator. Only sin. When you come here to Post Oak Presbyterian Church, this is one of the reasons why in the Presbyterian tradition we wear this robe. Because we want to take all of the focus off of us and how the minister is dressed. 
The focus is to be on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't even want you to hear my words this morning. I want you to hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. And only sin could cause mankind to desire to worship the creature more than the Creator. And there's lots of churches all across this county and lots of churches all across this world and and, and, and America and this world where the minister gets up and the people worship the minister and they're making a grave mistake because that minister is fallible and that minister can fall just as easily as you can fall this morning. We are not here to worship anyone else but the Lord Jesus Christ. So idolatry is inexcusable. And then the final practical application that I'd like for you to take with you this morning is this. The rejection of God in general revelation brings judgment. It brings judgment. For individuals who say there is no God, and they reject God's general revelation, there is coming a day of judgment. Now I want to read you these verses and we'll be done this morning. Romans chapter 1, the Apostle Paul says, For this cause, for what cause? Because individuals said, I, I'm going to worship the creature more than the Creator. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. The sin of homosexuality is a result. It's a result of denying God. Of saying there is no God. And I just saw a headline that said homosexuality on rise in our youth. On the rise in our youth. What do our youth know about those things? Well, it's what they're taught, right? It's they're, they're, they're taught to deny the God of Scripture. And what happens as a result, God gives individuals over to reprobate minds and they do all of these unnatural things because they don't follow the natural order of general revelation that says there is a God and we must bow the knee before this God. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, here's the problem. God gave them, they didn't, they didn't like to think about God. They didn't want anything to do with God in their thoughts, so they push him out and push him away. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Sound like America today? Sound like our hearts today? Hmm. Without the grace of God, there we are this morning. Disobedient to parents without understanding, covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. Who? Now he's going back to the heathen. He's going back to the pagan. He's going back to the unbeliever here. He says they know the judgment of God. Yet they commit such things that are worthy of death. Not only do they commit these things, but they have pleasure in others that do them. So it's not enough that The unbeliever commits their sin and and hates God and rebels against God, but they try to get as many people as they possibly can to do the same thing. And they love it when people deny God. But I want you to know something this morning, dear church. These unbelievers know the judgment is coming. They know it's coming. And how do they know? They know by their consciences. Last Scripture, and I'm done. For when the Gentiles which have not the law do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. No one will be able to stand before God one day and say, I did not know. 
God will say you had general revelation. Every day you woke up, you should have seen my glory. And in your conscience, God will say to the unbeliever, in your conscience, you knew that there was a judgment day coming. And you made the choice to continue to reject me. And you made the choice to continue to deny me and to worship the creature more than the Creator. And then He will say, Depart from Me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this should, those should be some of the scariest words in our hearts. We have friends, family, loved ones, school, young people, you have friends in school, Adults, you have co-workers. We have co-workers this morning. And one day they're going to stand before God and they're going to try and give God all their excuses and God's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. What are we doing about that? How can we hear this message and it not stir our hearts to pray for the lost? How can we hear this message and it not stir our hearts to pray for the unbelieving world all around us? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank You for revealing Yourself to all men through general revelation. And even more than that, God, We see that You are a God who is glorious. We see that You're a God who is creative. We see that You're a God who is orderly. We see You're a God who's personal. And we know that all unbelievers are without excuse because they see this every day. And their consciences bear witness of the fact there is a judgment day coming because of their sin. Oh God, please help us to weep and pray For those around us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our classmates, our loved ones, our friends, our family, whoever it may be, help us, God, to weep and pray for their souls. These things we ask in Jesus' name.